So the Philistines uh, heard the word that David has just been anointed king of Israel. And they went to they went to Vakesh at David. And the word Vakesh can mean several things. It can mean that they went to inquire of him, or, or they meant to look for him to kill him. By Shema David, how did he translate it here? The Philistines marched up in search of David. All right, either to search for him to kill him, or to search what's he up to. By Shema David, by Yerit el Suda, David heard that they're coming for him, and he went to Mitsuda David, the fortress of David. We've been learning about uh, the last few classes about the fortress of David. Let's immediately take a uh, one or two quick uh, commentaries here. What is this about that the Philistines heard? He was anointed king of Israel, and they came to search for him or inquire of him. What's that about? We have to go back to 1 Samuel, Shmuel Aleph, Perch of Zion, chapter 27, which we learned uh, many weeks ago. You'll recall that when King Saul was alive at the end of his life, towards the end of his life, he was pursuing David to kill him, fearing that, indeed, David's the anointed of God, who will be the next king when Saul's life ends, and therefore Saul's son, Jonathan, will not continue the family dynasty. And Jonathan was okay with that, Jonathan, but David, uh, but Saul, Shaul, he was not okay with that, and he kind of wanted to override God's will by killing David, and he pursued him everywhere, and obviously he didn't succeed ultimately in taking down David. And David couldn't just sit around saying, well, I've got God's promise, so you know, he can shoot at me all he likes, doesn't matter. David had to, you, you can't just rely on miracles. Uh, God helps those who help themselves. And David fled from Saul's armies. And in one case, he actually had to flee into the land of the Philistines under King Achish. We learned this. And he made an alliance with a Philistine king who was willing to ally with this guy who once had killed the great hero of the Philistines, Goliath, Goliath. He allied with him because he saw times had changed, and this great champion of Israel now is apparently public enemy number one of Israel and fleeing away from the king. So an enemy of my enemy is my friend. So if you recall, and we won't do this in Hebrew too much, just to catch up because it's something we learned before for the context, David said to himself, someday I shall certainly perish the hands of Saul. Best thing for me is to flee to the land of the Philistines. Saul then will give up hunting for me through the territory of Israel. I'll escape him. So David and his 600 men with him went and crossed over to King Achish. David and his men stayed with Achish in Gat. That's the same city where uh, Goliath, Goliath was from. Each man with his family, if you recall, so this is 600 men and probably 600 wives and kids. It's like 2,000 people. And David with his two wives, those were the first two, Achinoam and Abigail. Maybe Michal was first, but she wasn't with him because you remember that story about how she was, meanwhile, with Palti ben Laish after her father separated her from temporarily from David. That was Palti ben Laish, the guy with the sword in the bed. Remember that. And when Saul was told David fled to God, he indeed did not pursue him anymore. Okay, David said to Achish, if you please let a place be granted to me in one of the country towns where I can live. In other words, I don't want to be in your backyard in the capital. David's motivation is, I don't want him to see that I'm really, I'm really a son of Israel. I'm not a Philistine. And my heart is in Israel. And I'm not part of this. I don't want him to see what I'm really up to. I'm just, I just need sanctuary. And so I'm making an alliance, but if all thing, if, if I can make it understandable to King Achish, I'd like to persuade him to let me be based on the other side of his country. So he doesn't see what I'm up to. In those days, there were no cameras, no television, no radio, no internet. And you really would not necessarily know what's going on on the other side of your country. Today, you know, they have reporters right away sending live feeds and everything like that. So if you please let a place be granted to me in one of the country towns where I can live, why should you serve and remain with you in your royal city together with 2,000 others? And so, yeah, it made sense at the time. Achish granted him Tziklag. And that's how Tziklag eventually came to be part of the land of the kings of Judah, because David was in Tziklag in southern Philistia. And after 
eventually the breakup that brought David back to Israel and then wars between the Philistines and Israel, Siklag became part of the land of Israel. Okay, and so on and so forth. So they were at peace and not going to take out all that time on it right now. Uh, but they're, in fact, we're going to be revisiting chapter 27 on Thursday night when we talk about rescuing hostages. But anyway, okay, so David, last we remembered from there, he had an alliance with the Philistines. And suddenly today we're reading that the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel and they came marching up in search of him. And David, having heard that they're, that they're coming for him, went down to the, uh, I don't know about fastness, he went down to the, uh, fort, to, to the fortress of David. So Malbium comments on this. The Philistines had heard that David had become king. Ad Ata, and that's the word Ata with an Aleph, as I always remind you, is, means you, Y-O-U, and with an Ayan means now. Ad Ata, Chashvuhu Labal Brit Achish. Until David had become anointed king of Israel, the Philistines still until now regarded him as an ally, an ally uh, with Achish. They made an alliance, and we don't remember any breaking in the alliance. Lest we heard David is in an alliance with Achish in war against Israel. And whoa, did you see today's morning news? David is the king of Israel. How did that happen? We understood he's at war with King Saul. And now that we apparently heard he's the king, and they accepted him as the king. It's just not like he took the land by force to extend Philistine control over Israel. Rather, the people of Israel welcomed him as king. So they went to inquire, will David, as king of Israel, agree to bend the knee and pay a tax or tribute to the Philistines, regarding himself still not only as an ally, but subservient to the Philistines? Because Malbim is talking about that word, livakesh, uh, livakesh. To search or to inquire. Normally the Hebrew would be, and the Philistines came to make war against David or to meet with David. What does this mean to inquire to, to search David or to ask David? They wanted to find out what is he up to. And so Malbim tells us exactly what 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 he's up to. Okay. So let's just get that Malbim back for a moment. Okay. So they came to the Mitsuda, and let's go forward. So what we see is that the Philistines were trying to figure out what is David up to. Let's go back to the main text before we go to this Gemara. Uflishtim ba'u ba'inotshuba emek rifa'im. And the Philistines came and pretty much spread out and encamped at emek, which means valley, rifa'im. It's the name of the place. Technically, it means Healing, H-E-A-L. Sometimes I say a word and then I spell it out because sometimes I'm concerned that maybe my New York accent, you don't know which word I'm saying. And sometimes a word may have a homonym. And like if I'm saying healing, I want to be, so I'm referring to H-E-A-L, not H-E-E-L. Anyway, so the Philistines spread out at the Valley of Healing, Emek Rifaim. Let's see what we're talking about here. Um, the Philistines are where this map said, okay, there's the Mediterranean, right? From the river, Jordan River, to the sea, all of Israel will be free. So this is now called Gaza, and in those days, it was Canaan, or Canaan. Okay, so this is where Achish was based, and the Philistines. The Philistines were based in Gaza. That was their place. Throughout the Bible, when you hear about the Philistines, the Plishtim, their base of operation always was Gaza. And I've shown you other maps in the past when their individual cities were good to know about. Here's Gat, the capital, and Siklag was down here. Okay. So they go to Valley of Rephaim. And David is king now in Jerusalem, right? He used to be king in Hebron for seven and a half years. He relocated the capital to Yerushalayim, 
Jerusalem, cleared out the Yavusim, the Jebusites. Um, and now it's kind of a kind of like a a natural place for a battle. The Canaanites come in this way, meeting him halfway, and the Jews are going to meet him the other halfway. It's a natural place for the battle. And Baal Prizim, or Prazim is right over there. And this is a more simplified map. Uh, I couldn't find many, but it's the Philistines. It should be S apostrophe. Philistines' first attack against David, not of David. But I'm not complaining. It's a good, uh, I give the guy credit, whoever did this. He spelled Philistines right. And anyway, same idea. Philistines this away, Yerushalayim that away, Valley of Rephaim. Very good. Mighty men join David, all that good stuff. We continue. So the Philistines came to spread out at the Emek Rephaim, the Valley of Rephaim. By Sha'al David Bashem Limor, and David now asks God, God, I'm going to I'm going to battle, I think. I won't go if you tell me no. I know I'm not allowed to go to battle without first inquiring of you. Okay, let's remind ourselves. We learned this, but as with so many things, I, I, I want to tell you something I learned a long time ago from my uncle Yaakov. My uncle Yaakov was an enormous influence on me when I was in high school, in Yeshiva High School, and I was having trouble in Talmud class. All of us, the, in those days, the Talmud teachers were Holocaust survivors. They did not speak good English and they or talk good. They did not speak good English and they were not cool. They weren't in touch with us kids, us teenagers. Um, they were looking for work. They were our scholars. But we were kids in Brooklyn. We didn't we did not appreciate their scholarship. We wanted rabbis we could talk baseball with. We could talk Beatles and Rolling Stones. <laughs> These were rabbis. You if you tried to talk to them about the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, <laughs> It's just, you couldn't even talk to them about the Yankees. So we, I wasn't doing well in Talmud, even though I was like at the top of my class. I was running a, C, a strong C minus. Everybody else, forget about D. They weren't even running F, they were running G. Um, and so every Shabbat, I would go to Uncle Yaakov. It was about 40 minute walk. Don't drive on Shabbat. And after Shabbat lunch, every week, I would go 40 minutes, I'd walk to Uncle Yaakov, who was still not married in his 30s. Um, and he was living with his parents, my Bubby and Sadie, my grandmother and grandfather. So I would see my grandparents every Shabbos and I would uh, learn for an hour. He would teach me Gemara for an hour. And in one hour, he would teach me what the more than what the class had learned in the last five, five days in a, of two hours a day. So I learned 10 hours of Gemara in one hour twice as well. And so I really did look, I mean, I became a rabbi. He, he taught me to love Gamar. Why am I talking about Uncle Yaakov now? By the way, Bubby was always a prage. Every time I came, every Shabbos, she would say to me, Berola, which is the Yiddish name for Dove. Berola, when you go into uh, to learn Gamar with Yankala, tell him to get married. Would you do me a favor? Just tell him to get married. Doesn't matter who, just he should marry. Uncle Yaakov was like 35, 37. And I'd say, Bubby, I don't know. It's like not for me to say. She said, it's for you to say. It's a good thing mentioned by you. It'll be wonderful. So uh, once or twice I told Uncle Yaakov, Bubby would like you to get married. She said, he, he'd say, next Shabbos when you come, let Bubby know you told me. Okay? Long story short, Uncle Yaakov ended up marrying like at age 40. Okay? And he's got 11 kids. So slow and steady wins the race. That's all I can say about that one. Anyway, Uncle Yaakov had an expression. The most important commentator on the Torah and on Gemara was Rashi. And Rashi will have a comment on something, a commentary, and then he cites his source. And Uncle Yaakov taught me, he said, he learned from his Torah instructor, never trust Rashi. What do you mean by that? Rashi's the most trustworthy Torah giant who ever lived, pretty much. He said he learned the idea, never trust Rashi. Whenever Rashi cites a source, don't really assume he's wrong, but like make believe, wonder whether he's wrong. What I later learned, it's called in law school, site checking. Look it up. 
make sure he got it right. He always got it right. Uncle Yaakov's point, if you ever wonder how it is that I'm talking about this, and someone asks a question, and all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, I say, oh, wait a second, let's go. I think there's something in, in Genesis chapter 13, or in Numbers chapter 21, or in, and, and you think I'm a genius? I'm not a genius. I, I got a C minus. I was a genius compared to the guys getting D, F, and G. But Uncle Yaakov, I, I did what Uncle Yaakov taught me. For like the next 30, 40 years, I never trusted Rashi. And when you start looking everything up, and you go back to it, and you go back to it, and you go back to it, it becomes very much part of you. And that's why you've learned a lot of this Torah with me already for the last half year and more. And I'm not surprised. Sometimes we forget. I learned that six months ago, Rabbi. And, you know, I kind of forgot about that. And that's why I often will go back when they refer something. And it refreshes your memory so that you also could become an extraordinary scholar. And so if you don't trust Rashi, definitely don't trust me. Um, and let's go back. So here's what we learned. And it's very important um, to what we're learning right here. Let's get this open. Okay. Uh, we learned this about a half year ago. How do you consult the Urim and Tumim? Now, remember, the Torah in the book of Shemot, Exodus, teaches that when they built the Mishkan, the tabernacle and the desert that later becomes uh, more permanent and greater as the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, but during the 40 years of wandering in the desert, they had the Mishkan, the tabernacle. In that time, they had the Kohen in Parshat Tetzaveh, and the Torah portion Tetzaveh, and the Kohen's uh, garments. And he had special garments. And one of those things was to have a shield. He wore a shield over his chest, and it had in it the Urim and Tumim, if you remember. The Choshen Mishpat, that was the shield, and the Urim and Tumim were a piece of parchment that was inserted into the shield. And it was like putting a battery nowadays into an item. You get an item. If it doesn't have a battery, it doesn't operate. You put two double A's or triple A's into the uh, thing, and all of a sudden it starts working. The red light goes on, and you hear whirring and, 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 and buzzing, and, and the thing works. That was the Urim and Tumim. Uh, the Choshen and everything did not work, so to speak. And then when the parchment, the specific parchment was put in, it started lighting up. And you could ask a question of the Kohen Gadol, the high Kohen, the high priest. And, and the Kohen knew how to, those 12 jewels of different colors representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The Kohen knew how to manipulate and read it and get God's answer. So. Who's allowed even to ask, could I, could any Tom, Dick, and Harry uh, just go and ask the Cohen, hey, Mr. Cohen, uh, I have a question of God. I've, I've always wondered, you know, God, uh, how do you decide, how do you decide which days it's going to be hotter and which days it's going to be cool? You, you can't just go to the Cohen asking him questions all day. Hey, God, what do you like more, chocolate or vanilla? You, you can't, they can't do that. The only people who can ask the Cohen Gadol questions would be the following three. Uh, the king of Israel, and well, let's see, let's see what the uh, Gemara says. Yoma, tractate that deals with the laws of Yom Kippur, but as with all Gemaras, it also segues. Duff's uh, Ayin Gimel Amabet, folio 73b. The ancient Alin El Lamelech. And people can't just go around asking, only the Melech, the king. Minahani Mele. How do we know this? From what source? Amar Rabbi Avahu, Rabbi Avahu said, the Amar Kra, because it says in the Torah, the Lifnei Elazar HaKohen Ya'amod V'Sha'alo B'Mishpat Ha'urim. And it says in the Torah, um, who should go? Well, let's see. Numbers 27. When it talks about investing, with, he's talking about the laws of the king. This is the same area, and like we talk about the king, and we talk about um, we we talk about uh, going to battle, and the king's going to lead away. And then there's a mashuach, there's a kohen mashuach. There's the high kohen, the kohen gadol, and there's the anointed kohen, specifically who holds the position 
of leading the nation in battle as the figure who goes forth in the front. And so on and so forth, invest them with some of your authority so that the whole Israel community may obey. And he shall present himself to Eleazar the priest, who shall on his half, behalf seek the decision of the Urim before God. By such instruction they shall go out, and by such instruction they shall come in. He and all the Israelite militia and the whole community. In other words, you don't go to war, you don't come back from war, unless God says so. And how do you know what God's saying, since you're not a prophet per se? God tells you through the Urim and Tumim, the king asks of the Kohen Gadol, please ask the question of God. I'm going to war or not? So he should go, is that Melech? That's the king. Behold, B'nai Yisrael Ito, that verse I just read you, says he and all the children of Israel with him. And that refers to the Meshuach Milchama, the other Kohen who's the anointed to lead in battle. Behold, Ha'edah Zo Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin, which is the sort of like Supreme Court, the the supreme elders of the Jewish people, like a Supreme Court, those are the only ones who have the authority to ask the Kohen Gadol, to ask God through the Ormin Tumim, what should be done with this possibly impending war. If this were going on today, if there were a holy temple, a Beta, a beta Mikdash, and if you had Torah people running the government of Israel, not secular people, they would be going to the Kohen, and you would, they don't, there is no Kohen Gadol now, because there's no temple, but they would be going to the Kohen Gadol and asking, should we continue fighting in Gaza? Should we stop? Should we start the war that's coming in Lebanon? Should we wait? Uh, so this is like real stuff, only there's no, no Kohen Gadol, but this is the real thing. And that same Gemara continues. How do you ask? Okay, we just learned who can ask? The king? the anointed Kohen, that is the Kohen anointed to lead everyone in battle, and the Sanhedrin, the like Supreme Court elders. Okay, how do you ask? And again, to save time, I'll mostly do it in English. The sages taught, how does one consult the Urim and Tumim? The one asking stands with his face toward the one who was asked, that is, you face the Kohen, Gadol. And the one who's asked the Kohen, Gadol, he turns his face toward the divine presence, namely, he looks at the Urim and Tumim, in which the explicit name of God is found, by tilting his head downward. He pulls, he, he looks down. He doesn't pull out the parchment to look at the parchment. He looks at those 12 stones that now are like flickering on and off. The one who asks says his question, shall I pursue after this troop? And he brings like in Shmuel Aleph Paraglamet, where a war was pending. David said to the priest of Yatar, son of Achimelech, please bring the ephod to me. When Avyatar brought up the ephod, David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue those raiders? Will I overtake them? And he, capital H, God, answered, not with words, but through the Urim and Tumim, pursue, for you shall overtake and you shall rescue. So you ask a question of the Kohen Gadol who looks down and, and interprets and says, here's what the Urim are explaining. Thus says God. Go up and succeed. Rabbi Yudha says he doesn't have to say, thus says God. That's kind of implied. Rather, just have to say, go up and succeed. Okay. One does not ask in a loud voice. You don't go to the Kohen Gadol and say, hey, should I go to war? And you don't just go and like, like think of it, like meditate. Rather, you should ask very softly so that your lips are moving, but barely can the words be heard. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God can hear you plenty well. And she, he should not think in his question is hard, but should enunciate it. Okay, because first of all, what did the verse say? The verse said, he shall present himself, da -da 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 -da, and he shall enunciate, v'sha'al lo, shall, on his, it's a bad translation. Visha'al, if you know your Hebrew, Sha'al means, and he shall ask. So it explicitly says he should ask. Okay, so he should ask. How shall he inquire? He should do akin to the way that Chana 
in the beginning of First Samuel chapter one, the Haftarah that's read on Rosh Hashanah, the way that Hannah spoke in her prayer when she went to the Mishkan, uh, the tabernacle in, at that time in Shiloh, the Jews had come across the Jordan River under Joshua, and they'd set up the tabernacle from the desert now, now in Shiloh. And she went there to pray. She was childless and begged, if you'll give me a child, I, I'll dedicate that child to your holy service, O God. And God responded by giving her a child, and that was Samuel, Shmuel, who, whom she gave to Eli the Kohen to uh, rear him as a young man in the service of God. And he was reared so well that he eventually became the prophet Shmuel. Okay, it says, Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice could not be heard. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 13, okay, sometimes it loads quickly, and sometimes it loads not. Okay, but uh, give it one more try. Oh, there we go. Hannah was praying in her heart. Only her lips moved. So based on that, we learned that you should move your lips, not just me meditating, and just make yourself heard softly as we're asking a question. What the, one does not ask two matters simultaneously. When you're asking God, one asks only one question. After you're answered, you could ask a second question. And even if he asks about two matters simultaneously, you're only going to get one answer, namely the first thing you asked of the two. Only regard to the one of them, and he's answered only with regard to the first. And this is what happened in Shmuel uh, 23, verse 11, where he asked, he was going to go to war. Uh, uh, Shmuel, you may remember, Saul was pursuing David to kill him, and David found sanctuary in the city of Keilah, inside their gates. But then Saul started coming towards that city, and David started getting concerned, what if the people in the city turn me over? On the one hand, they're nice and friendly, but then they get scared of the king. They'll do to them what they did to the Kohanim, the priests of Nob, when he massacred all the priests of the city of Nob, except for one that he missed, the young boy. And so he, he didn't know what to do, David. So he had the Kohen with him, the one who, who survived Nob, and he had his father's Urim and Tumim, if you recall. And David said, asking of God through the Urim and Tumim, O Lord, God of Israel, your servant has heard that Saul intends to come to Keilah and destroy the town because of me. Question one, will the citizens of Keilah turn me over? Number two, will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, God of Israel, tell your servant. And God said he will. In other words, we see from the Bible, he should only ask one question at a time. He has two questions at a time. God answered the first question or the second question. Wait, what? He answered the second question. Gemara said he answers the first question. We'll go back to Gemara. Will the citizens of Keilah deliver me? He will, refer singular. Will Saul come down? He will. Uh -huh. So David continued, I think you only answered the second question Ah, uh, I made the mistake of answering two at one, of asking two at one. Let me re-ask the first. Will the citizens of Gila deliver me and my men into Saul's hands? The Lord answered, they will. And that's how David knew that he had to get out of Keilah fast. So as it says with regard to King David, that he asked two questions. Will the men of Keilah deliver me? Will Saul come down? And God said, he will come down. Gamar asks, but didn't you just say that if one asks two questions, he's answered only with regard to the first? Yet here the verse says that, he got an answer for the second. Gomorrah answers, David asked the questions out of order, and he was answered in order. He should have asked first whether Saul would come down, and afterward what the people of Keilah would do. So that's how that's worked out. Reminds me of Mr. Merlis, my uh, high school social studies teacher, who was a kibitzer, and he always, whenever he saw we were falling asleep, um, he would he would tell a joke. And he talked about the... Uh, the great bread and butter theory. Boys, you know about the great, but we know boys school, yeshiva. Boys, you know about the great bread and butter theory. And everybody's looking at each other. Uh oh, this is going to be on the exam. And uh, no, it's not going to be on the exam. He's doing a joke. So he says, one day, these two Jews in Russia had a big argument. One said to the other, Do you know if you put butter on bread, one side, and you throw the bread in the air, no matter how you throw it in the air, how you flip it, it always will land on the buttered side. It's the bread and butter thesis. The other guy said, I don't believe it. 
And the first guy says, I'll prove it to you. It will always land on the buttered side. And the other guy says, let me see. And the other guy takes the book, takes bread, puts butter, throws it in the air. And sure enough, it lands not on the buttered side. He says, I told you a stupid theory. And the first guy says, well, Schmendrick, you, you buttered the wrong side. So in the same way, um, what, what actually, in a more serious way, David did not ask the questions in the proper logical order. Will the people hand me over? Logically, the first question is, will Saul come? Because if Saul doesn't come, there's no need to ask the second question. So that's how the Gemara is saying. But the bottom line is, if the matter requires two, two questions uh, have to be asked, then you ask them serially. If the matter is urgent, requires two questions simultaneously, no time, then you may ask both questions simultaneously. And he's answered with regard to the two together. But that's only pikuach nefesh if it's like a life and death and there's no time. So that's to refresh our memories how David would always consult with the Kohen Gadol, the Urim and Tumim. And the Gemara, we're going to move on from the Gemara now to keep, keep in, in, in sync with where we're going. Uh, but the Gemara also adds when a prophet, a Navi, makes a prophecy that is not a good prophecy, not a happy prophecy, God sometimes will reverse the evil prophecy if the people repent. But when something is, a decree is issued by God's answer through the Urim and Tumim, it never can be retracted. Okay, so that gives us an idea of what David's doing here. So David goes by Yeshal David Bashem Limor. That's what it means when it says David inquired of the Lord. He went to the Kohen Gadol and he asked through the Urim and Tumim, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? Ooh. So he's asking two questions. First of all, he's not asking more than two. And we just learned that God typically answers only one, the first one, the first logical one. But if it's life and death and there's no time to stop and think and ask him, he'll answer both. And the Lord answered, go up. Shall I go up? Go up. Will you deliver them into my hands? I will deliver the Philistines into your hands. You might think, why even ask the second? If God says, go up, why even ask whether you'll deliver the Philistines? Because you don't know. What if God forbid, God forbid, there's a punishment coming. And it's part of God's plan that the people are going to go up to fight. And it's part of the plan that it's not going to end up well. So he needs that security. David always asked of God, unlike Saul. King Saul sometimes asked, but sometimes did not ask and did not follow the strict rule of what he was told. And this is a tremendously dramatic difference between David and Saul. Saul, we learned many times, was a tzaddik, very righteous. Let's not doubt that. But David brought it up even a higher notch. David David. And David went to the place called Baal Pratzim, and he defeated the Philistines. Um, uh, that's a word, my enemies, Oyevai. It's not the same as Oyevai. It sounds similar, um, but of course has a different meaning. Oyevai, God has, uh, has defeated my enemies. Lefonai keparitzmaim. Alken karashem amakom hu ba'pratzim. Let's, let's take out a moment here. So God has, has taken them and they've won in Baal Pratzim. The battle was in Valley of Raphaim and a little bit south is Baal Pratzim. That's where the war actually took place. It's a little bit like what happened in Gettysburg. Uh, Robert E. Lee was taking his men. The, the plan was to attack in Maryland. And they went from Richmond, and the idea was to go through Pennsylvania into Maryland and then attack the Union armies in Maryland under General Meade. And if they would win that, it would be a clear path to taking the White House and Lincoln. And what happened was to get to Maryland, you had to go through Pennsylvania, and someone spotted a big, big, huge uh, Confederate army 
And so they got out the alert and the Union armies raced into Pennsylvania. So that's like, imagine like here. And then with the two facing off, it was sort of, where are we going to fight? Clearly, we've got to fight. And right nearby, there was a big, big open field. And that was about, that was Gettysburg. And that's how that ended up. So they're in the Valley of Rafaim, and they ended up at Baal Parazim. And that's where they're fighting. Now, Akadosh Baruch Hu leads them to victory. And after the Philistines get really badly beaten, they regroup and they come back for more. Again, that happens, especially, well, it happens. Uh, I was going to say in the old days, but even Hamas, you know, they, they don't give up. They just come back for more. And uh, it happens in a lot of places that they regroup. Uh, the, the war of Putin against uh, Ukraine. Uh, Putin has had, some, has had some successes here and there. And then you hear about that Ukraine organizes for a counteroffensive and things like that. So the Philistines who survived reorganized for counteroffensive by Natshuba Emek Rafaim, and they came back to Emek Rafaim. Let's do it again. And that's sort of, again, like I, uh, I refer to the Civil War. They had a battle in Manassas, um, and the first battle of Manassas, and, uh, and then they had a second battle of Manassas, same location. Okay. A bull run. The South called it Bull Run, and the North called it Manassas. And Manassas actually is from the Hebrew name Manasha. By Yishal David Bashem, and again, for the counteroffensive, David again asks God, he goes back for the Urim and Tumim. What should I do this time? By Yomer, Lo Ta'aleh, and God had a different answer this time. Don't go straight up, straight forward to attack frontally. Hasev el Acharehem, rather go circuitously around them. You know where they're going to come because you just had the previous battle. So you know where the battle lines are drawn. But don't go to your side of those battle lines. While they're going to their same battle lines, you, knowing where they're going, go circuitously around so that you're kind of behind them, and you'll be sort of along Bechaim tree, Baka trees, whatever they are, you'll be in like a forest of trees, and you'll be near them amid the trees. And here's it really important. And you wait. You're going to go around the Philistines who are looking to slaughter you. And you're going to wait with your men patiently. You're not simply going to go behind them and ambush them. You're going to wait and wait and wait. And you're just going to wait and only go into action. At the right moment, the trees will start rustling. And that's when God is ready to wipe out the Philistine camp. And David did exactly as God commanded. And they slaughtered the Philistines. The entire, basically, battle camp. There was not going to be a third counterattack after that one. But the rabbis have a lot to talk about here in the last part of our class for today. First, the Rabbi Abarbanel. So Rabbi Abarbanel, I obviously prepared class for you, and therefore it's a very long commentary on this one. I'm just going to read you the part that I, it, it's really long. I've just picked, prepared the last part. Jews should not count on God for miracles. You have to do what you have to do. And you pray to God, and you hope that your prayers and your righteousness in regular behavior will merit God's miracles. But you can't count on it. You have to do what you have to do, but there's no guarantees of miracles. And the question is, how do you know if you're going to have a miracle? Ki ein ra'u ishi asuha nisim, ki im lehechrech rav. 
as a general rule, you don't merit, the people don't merit miracles, except when it's life or death. But under regular circumstances where you could really use a miracle, you normally don't get a miracle. If you learn how to appreciate the miracles of every day, even the small miracles of God, you will realize every day of your life you have miracles. And if you sit and you think back on moments in your life, you realize all oh, the miracles. How did I end up in this community? How did I end up with this job that I did like? The job that would have been that I wanted and that I got, but would have been terrible. How did I get fired? against what I wanted, only to end up in a better job and a happier life. The marriage that I always wanted, that broke down. How did that happen? What went, oh my gosh, it led to the best marriage I, I ever could have thought of. This investment I was going to make that I didn't make, and then I ended up with all this wealth. Or the decision to send my children to this school or to that school. There are so many things. So the, the time I was in a rush, and I started to run across the street without looking, and I don't know how I didn't get run over. I mean, so many things to remember in a lifetime. I'm not saying these are my experiences, but they certainly are the experiences that people have told me about. So you don't automatically get massive, like, like six-day war, or Yom Kippur war ex miracles, but they're all there every day. So meanwhile, what's going on here with this battle that David won? standing on the other side, going circuitously, waiting in the trees. Why didn't Saul continue coming out with military victories and great miracles against the Philistines? Rather, tragically, he died in a battle. With, he won many battles with the Philistines, but tragically died at the hands of Philistines with his sons. Why was that not also a miracle for him? In the past, we learned five different reasons the rabbis believe that Saul did not merit miracle that day. Um, he had sought out a, uh, a fortune teller and other things. So Abarbanel explains, Abarbanel says, there were two things that Saul did, particularly at times of war with the, with the enemy, the Philistines, the Amalekites, and he did not honor the word of God. He actually got the word of God, and he didn't quite follow it. Lo shamar at the var Hashem, velo lakach et samimenu. And he did not follow the advice he was given, in the matters of war. In one occasion, Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet, told him, go in the following place to Gilgal, and wait seven days, and I'll be there further instructions. And if you remember, uh, Saul waited until the last day and then offered the sacrifices and, and began the process before Samuel arrived. And only when Samuel arrived, and then he said, oh, my gosh, I thought you weren't going to come. And, and Samuel said, you couldn't wait for me the way God said. He will not wait for you when it comes to filling your dynasty. Lo begilgal, kilo shamar hazman. Asher Amar Shmuel, not in the Gilgal where Saul failed to wait the necessary time, it's Shmuel told him. Velo Amalek, and likewise, Shaul did not properly follow when the war of Amalek, and he was told to kill everyone, and he did not kill the king and some of their cattle and sheep. Shalo Asa Hanakama Asher Tziva Hashem He did not fulfill what he was commanded. Rotsa. It Barach. So God wanted to show the nations of the world and officers in the world and officers among the Jews, that David was of a different caliber and he followed and honored what he was commanded at wartime. David would not ever let a word of God fall to the ground, so to speak. And therefore, here he was in a war with the Philistines, 
And the Philistines are coming on a counteroffensive, wanting revenge for having just lost the previous battle. And David wants to go at him. And the last thing he wants to do is just wait around, wait around for trees to start rustling. The Shivo Yutav Yitbarach, God told him, Shaloya Aleh, the Shei Sovalacharehim, that he should not go forward frontally, but instead should go circuitously around. Until he hears the rustling of the trees. And that, why didn't God tell him, go ahead and go for them frontally? If God can lead them to win one way and already help them win one way, why not again? In order to test him, will he honor and observe and guard the word of God? Or will he transgress the word of God as Saul did? Likewise, we see here in the commentary of, of the of the Chomat Anach, the Chomat Anach, which uh, a lot of the rabbinic commentaries sort of uh, took took uh, sort of uh, nicknames, or a better term would be uh, pseudonyms. Chomat Anach means high wall. The high wall uh, that was his name in commentaries. Hamafaresh b'devravia mim etc. etc. He goes on. He says. It talks about midat adin lefnei makom, the way of God's judgment. Resh bet shin ayin, ribono shel olam, master of universe. Lama he'evarta et Shaul milefnei David. Why, master of universe, did you replace Saul with David? Omar la al shalohim tin l'shmuel l'shmuel shivat yamim ka'asher tzivahu. God answers because. Saul did not wake, se wait seven days for Samuel the way he was commanded. Omar la, hey kuf bet hey hakarish baruchu, anasa ata et David hased mi alehim. And so, sort of like the uh, the counterpoint in in heaven said, "Well, are you going to test David the same way?" And God said, "I will test David, and I will tell him to wait." The cholze shamar David. And David did wait, as he was commanded. And likewise, the Malbim, again, like the others, I'm, it's a long one, and I'm just picking out the bottom one. Similar thing. So here we are learning that God said that they should line up behind the Philistines, but they should not attack until they hear the rustling, rustling leaves of the trees. And again, this additional commentator says it was to test David in the aftermath of we saw that Saul did not wait for Samuel. And for that reason, the crown, the kingship was taken from Saul. David, on the other hand, observed God's command. This is why I'm giving you this parallel commentary, but he adds something more. That as powerful as David was as a military man from his first battle with Goliath through all of his wars, he never put faith in his own strength. Vav Aleph Lamed Yamarle, Os Techeratskios, it says, Ki Hashkacha Davka Imho Emuna. David was, David clung to faith. Bahanes Davak Im Haboteach, and God's miracle went to him who had faith, who believed. And because of that, Vahagam Shabapama Rishon Nitzham, Bederach Hateva. And that's why the first battle also, he won. He'emin b'ashem. He always believed in God. And so, but what's the deal with the rustling of the trees? That you'll wait till you hear the treetops? These are angels, says Rashi, stepping on the tops of the trees that I'm sending to help you. God 
is literally sending his angels from heaven. And you will know they've arrived. You're not going to see them. You won't find footprints in the ground, but you will hear the rustling of the trees. It's not only that I want you to wait, show patience in the way Shaul did not for Shmuel, Saul did not for Samuel. I'm testing you. But I also want the nation of Israel to have that strength because it says in the Torah, what does it say in the Torah? Deuteronomy, Devarim, Parakhov, chapter 20. This is in the Torah, not this battle. This is Moshe, Moses talking to the Jews. The words you're going to have is you're going into the land of Israel. And he says you're going to have the Kohen HaMashiach, the anointed Kohen at the front, and he's going to make an announcement, a speech. Hear, O Israel, you are about to enter battle with your enemy. Let not your courage falter. Do not fear. Do not be in panic. Do not dread them. Have faith in God. And now the very famous pasuk that our class every Sunday, it's like the last thing you hear every Sunday for the last six months when I play the prayer for the armed forces of Israel. And it ends with Omar Amen. The very last sentence of the of the prayer for the armed forces, we play it every single week at the end of the class. For it is your God, it comes straight from the Torah. Deuteronomy 20, Perchaf of Devarim, for it is your God Hashem, who marches with you to do battle for you against your enemy, to bring you victory. Psychologically, believing Jews believe this. When they go to war, they believe it. It's part of the Jewish, it's not only like it's a DNA, it's the, you're reared with that, that if God forbid battle comes, know that God will be there with you. It's an extraordinary idea. So they're standing there with David and they're, they're terrified. I mean, look, adrenaline is adrenaline, humans are humans. They know that they're facing a horrific enemy in the Canaanites and they want to get to war and let, let's, we, we, it's hard to just stand here. And David is saying, we have to, we have to just stand here. Because I asked in the Urim and Tumim, and that's what God said. You have to go to such and such location, and you're just going to have to stand there until you hear a rustling of the leaves. Well, we're standing here, we don't hear any rustling. There's no wind, there's no breeze. Well, just got to keep standing and waiting. Well, you know, they're going to turn around, they're going to figure out we're behind them. They're going to turn around, we, we have the advantage, the Surprise, we're just going to have to wait. David says, just going to have to wait. God said, wait, we have to wait. And what could they do? David's the leader. He's the general. He's the, he's the king. And a lot of people are not having a good time. And God is saying, nevertheless, you tell them to wait. I am going to make it when they do hear that rustling of the leaves. They are going to become so empowered and encouraged. They're going to feel it. God just arrived, so to speak. His angels just arrived. Uh, the cavalry just we the cavalry just came. They will feel that the angels of God have now arrived to fight our war. Because that's what it says, that God will fight for you. As we're wrapping it up, of course, this last source, So we just learned several times over, when you'll hear the rustling of the leaves in those trees, that's when you get going. Well, for this second uh, battle, the counteroffensive by the Philistines, they were pretty darn close. Uvaim the Israel Rolimotam, and and the Jews under David, they 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 kind of could see. They saw them in their eyes, right? You don't shoot till you can see their eyes. They saw that they're they're, they're really close. They're no longer far away. They're right over there. Eladalid Amot, 
They're like four cubits away. They're like six feet away. A cubit is between one and a half and two feet. So they're between six and eight feet away. You could actually extend your arm with your sword and you're already hitting the other guy. Amrulo Yisrael, David ma anu amdim. The Jews in the army said to David, their leader, David, why are we still standing here? Amar lahem mitzuva ani min ha elokim. I have been, he said, I've been commanded directly by God, brackets, by the Urim and Tumim, I asked God directly through the high Kohen, Shalolif Shvot Adsha Er Er Ilanot Menanim, that I'm not allowed to go forward and start fighting until the trees start rustling. Omar Lahem, in Poshtim Anu Yad Bahem, David said, if we attack now, before those tree leaves rustle, Anu Metim, we're dead. God will not be with us, we will be dead. And yeah, if we don't raise up our arms with swords, I guess we'll also be dead. Better we should be dead, dying as tzaddikim, righteous people who to the very end follow the word of God, than to be dying as people who in our very last acts of life defied God's command. And so, Ani Amar Lahem, Ani Ba'atem Nitla Enenu Be'hakadosh Baruch Hu. So David said, all of you and I will place our eyes in the Holy One. Miyad Kiven Shetalu Enehem, Miyad Na'anunu Ha'ilanot. Immediately as their eyes looked up to heaven, immediately the trees started rustling. Umiyad Pashtu Yad, and immediately the Jews went to battle. Kafmem Shin Kamasha Katuv, as it says, Vayas David Ka'ashut Siva Elokim Begomer. And David did according to how God had commanded. And so, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Amar HaKadosh at the end of the war, God in heaven said to his ministering angels in heaven, Re'u Ma Ben David L'Sha'ul. Here we go. Look at the difference of David and Saul. Mi garan le David lehinat sel, hu vi Yisrael, adiber she ha'ira lahem ner l'ragli devracha. And so that's the learning for today. Uh, and the takeaway, aside from a remarkably fa fascinating story in the Bible, because uh, we learn it partly, it's just fun. It's, it's fun to learn. And it's Jewish history. It's nice to learn that too. And by the way, the more the more navi you learn, the more you begin to realize. For now, that's our land. We don't want. We don't care what they say in Hamas. We don't care about from the river to the sea. I've studied the navi. What do you mean you were there first? We were there first. How do you know? Why don't you come to Rabbi Fisher's class? And let me and let me tell you, Christians know it too. Christians who believe in in God, they call it the Old Testament, but they believe it too. There are no Arabs in their Bible for this. There were no Muslims. If the Jews weren't there, then Jesus wasn't there. If there was no holy temple, the way that Muhammad, uh, what's his name, Abbas says, that there never was a temple, they made it up, then Jesus wasn't at the temple. It means the whole Christian religion also is false. He's not only attacking us. There's nothing more empowering, more than the best speech by Douglas Murray or Natasha Hausman or me, the, the nothing more empowering in knowing the righteousness of Israel's cause than learning Navi. But on top of all that, the even more important final point, the power of Navi is we learn how to live our lives today as Jews. And as people who fear God, even if, even if we're not Jews, some of our people in class are not Jewish. But it teaches us we have to conduct our lives fearing God and doing the right thing. And sometimes it may not seem like the best idea, just like it may not have seemed the best idea to wait at those trees when you have the advantage of surprise. If God has said this is what to do, you have to do it the way God says to do it, and it will succeed. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening.
Uh, we will meet on Thursday, God willing, and I'll take Janet's question. Thanks for being here. Yes, so, Janet. Rabbi, um, regarding the question and answer protocols, so, so suppose someone encounters something like the two who encountered the question about being Tame for, and then the Pesach Sheni. So, um, that's in so, chapter nine of the book of numbers. Right. So, so those people were able to directly approach Moshe would, in this case, later on, would they approach the Sanhedrin or how does that work to ask? And then the Sanhedrin would ask the Kohen Gadol or, I mean, you're saying not everyone can ask, but there could be some legitimate thing that would still needs, even those years later, strangely enough, that still needed clarification. Thank you. In chapter nine of uh, Bamidbar, the uh, book of Numbers, it recounts in those days in order to observe and celebrate the Passover and uh, sacrifice the Passover lamb, which doesn't apply at a time that there's no holy temple. Um, a person may not participate in that service and may not touch that lamb or sacrifice that lamb if he or she has come in contact, even inadvertently, with a with a deceased or walked in a cemetery or been under a, in a house where in the other room, a, a, a dead person was. And so it recounts that people like that, and they went to Moshe, Moses, and said, like tomorrow, whatever, it's going to be Passover, or three days, and we are at Tame Met, we're, we're currently impure because of the uh, contact with the dead, what are we supposed to do? And it ends up that at that time, in that place, they were given a fallback date a month later, the 15th of ER, and on that day, they could do the Passover. Uh, doesn't mean that we're allowed nowadays to have a fallback. That was then. And today, everybody has come into contact with the dead. We've all been in cemeteries at one point or another, or, or in a hospital where there's a morgue, anything where a deceased person is under the same roof. And uh, since everybody is Tamei Met, it does not apply because there's not a holy temple of Bet HaMikdash through which the Para Aduma, the red heifer, could be used to purify. And besides, nowadays for Passover, we don't do the Korban Pasach, the, the lamb. So everybody can go to the Seder and all of that. Janet's question is, the way that was resolved is those people who had come into contact with the deceased went to Moshe. And Moshe was able to turn and ask God, and what do you do today? Or what do you do when there's not a Moshe? And nowadays, you go to, the, to your rabbi. That's what you do. And who is my rabbi? For some people, the important thing is you have to have, a, everybody has to have a rabbi. You cannot go forum shopping, what we call in secular law. You cannot decide this rabbi has a reputation for being very lenient on kosher stuff. And this rabbi has a reputation for being very lenient on Sabbath rules. He's strict on other things, but he's, he's lenient on Sabbath. And this Rabbi has a reputation of being very lenient on mikvah laws. So you can't decide, well, I have a mikvah question, I'm going to that lenient one, and I have a Shabbos question, that lenient one. You'll have to have a rav. It's supposed to be the same thing in secular law. You're not supposed to forum shop, though clearly they do. I mean, if you want to go after Trump, so you go after him in a blue district, for example, and in a few years, if they're able to go after Biden, you'll find they'll be going after him in Alabama, Mississippi. So the thing is that you're not allowed to forum shop. So everybody, right now, everybody's supposed to pick a rabbi who's your rav. How do you pick a rav? We don't have a lot of time right now, but I'll go through some real, real quick. And that's the answer to Janet's question today. If there's a question, you have to ask your rav if you don't otherwise immediately know it. Um, some people, and, and there is no one way to pick a rav. Some people pick the rav of their shul. Here's the shul I go to, and I don't have a rav for any other purpose. And yeah, he's my rav. And that's when you ask all the questions too. Some people, let's say you're Sephardi and your rabbi of Yeshua is Ashkenazi and you feel, I don't think he, you know, I've got these rice on Passover questions and other things. You're allowed to pick a Sephardic rav, someone from where you come from. Or maybe there's a difference of being a Sephardic Jew from Morocco or from Yemen. So you may want to decide, I want to find a rav who hails, descends from the Yemen line. So you could do that. Or you may decide, I go to yeshiva, and this is my rebbe in yeshiva, and I'm learning a lot, and he's going to be my lifetime rebbe. For me, for example, as a young man, my rabbi was Rabbi Drillman, 
Sifrona Lavracha, blessed memory. He was the rabbi of Glenwood Jewish Center where our family davened. And I developed a personal relationship with him even as a boy, 13, 14, 15 years old. And Rabbi Joel became a rabbi. Later in high school, um, I had a Rabbi Dardek my freshman year. And he was the one Rebbe in high school, different from all the others I described earlier. And he became a Rebbe. When I studied for Smicha and uh, at, in, in Ritz in the Yeshiva University Rabbinic Seminary, one of my Rebbe's was Rabbi Tendler Zabron Lavracha. And he became my Rebbe. And for the rest of my life, until he passed away, if I had, an, if I had a question that by this point, 40 years in the rabbinate, I didn't know how to answer and didn't know how to find an answer, I would turn to Rav, Rav Tendler. And that's what people do. You go to your... You go to a Rebbe on your Rebbe, and if your Rebbe doesn't know the answer, he'll ask his Rebbe till he gets an answer. And it was famous in previous generation. It ultimately would go to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein or uh, Rav uh, Chacham uh, Rav Avadi Yosef. They used to say that everybody, every Jew, every Orthodox rabbi in the 1960s, they used to say that every Orthodox rabbi in America, when he gets ordained the rabbi, gets smicha, whether it's out of Yeshiva University or, or, or Lakewood or wherever, when you get smicha, they give you a beautiful certificate that you could frame, establish you are a rabbi, you're a, you're a, you're a, and they give you a little piece of paper with Ramosha Feinstein's phone number. And with that, you're good to go. So that's the answer. Again, have a wonderful evening. Great question. And I'll see you, God willing, Thursday or one of those other sets. Bye-bye.